Okay, we've got another great endo case here. Before and after, you can see there was some sclerosis on these canals. This was an older gentleman. You can see over here, there's some sclerosis in those canals. And so back to the question that somebody asked a while ago, what do you do with sclerotic canals? The best you can. Now, what you want to be sure of, if it's a sclerotic canal, is that you clean out to the area of sclerosis. Because if it's truly sclerotic and you try to go through it, you have a high probability of making a not ideal situation much worse. If you perforate the root, you know, you can use your perforation sealer and it's probably going to be just fine, but it complicates it. You know, you've got bleeding to deal with and other things. So go to the sclerotic area, use your scalp file on the drill, which is fantastic. It'll find any little tiny opening. Be sure when you're trying to get to the apical portion of the canal, you use lubrication with the sodium hypochlorite solution in the canal with the scalp file. Painless anesthetic is so important with these cases. Interligamental is imperative if you're performing endodontics, unless it's a very elderly person. With those patients, the nerve is is pretty sclerotic and it's probably not so important, but I always give it because I do not want my patients to feel anything, especially if you're extracting a tooth, performing endodontics, a crown on a tooth, something that's pretty significant because patients are terrified of dentistry. That's the greatest thing to me about dentistry is it's so hard to do and people are so afraid of it because I am really good at dentistry and I know every patient I see is going to have zero pain. I mean, they may have post-op pain if we take out their wisdom teeth or do some kind of surgery, but they're going to have zero pain during the procedure and they will rename their children after you if you can make it totally painless. People are terrified. Of, most Many people are terrified of dentistry, so use sedation, and be able to completely anesthetize teeth. That is step one in being a successful dentist. Know how to use this rubber dam technique. Like I said in the previous video, it takes me about 15 seconds to place this rubber dam using this technique. I'm cleaning out the decay, removing the old filling, and this tooth was painful to biting pressure, extremely painful to biting pressure and had a crack into the nerve of the tooth. This is a coarse football diamond, which is great for access opening. Now remember, this is so important. Somebody asked a question a while ago, what, what do you do if it's really hard to get into the mesial buccal canal? The reason it's probably hard for you to get into it is you're not moving the access opening facial enough because you want direct access into each of these canals. You don't want to have to curve the file and go this way. Alex Flory taught me this technique. He's a world-class endodontist in Dallas. He said, you must, move, you must open the access palatally and facially to the point that you're going straight into the canal like this, not like that. I'm very gently, you know, connecting the canals. And I'll use this and then I'll use a slow speed. Let's see, I've moved the access opening to the facial and the palatal. So I've got direct access. Now, once I open into the canals, even though I've done, this is a maxillary tooth, even though I've done an infiltration anesthesia and an intraligamental, once I have opened into the pulp chamber, I'll come back with local anesthesia. This is 2% lidocaine, 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. I don't use 1 to 50,000 epinephrine because it can cause a patient to have heart palpitations. There's so much epinephrine in it. 1 to 100, and I'll inject straight into the pulp chamber just to be totally 100% sure that tooth is numb, numb, numb. Continuing with my access opening, this is so important that I'm finding the canals with my Explore at pretty sclerotic canals, the two facial canals and the palatal canal. So these are the these are the instruments I use. The scalp file is inserted into the handpiece. The headstrom hand files, 25 millimeters, 10, and the K type, 25 millimeters at 10. And these are hand files. And then the EJO2 is the real world endo brazilier. Both of these are brazilier. 
drill. We've now gone from about four separate drills to this one drill, which is fantastic. I was skeptical when it first came out and it looks so funky, I thought, can that really work? But because it's curved, it goes out into the sides of the canal and really, really cleans it out. You want to be sure that you have filled the canal with three parts water, one part sodium hypochlorite. Three to one water to sodium hypochlorite and leave that in the pulp chamber so the pulp chamber is always lubricated and that sodium hypochlorite will kill any bugs that are in there. Okay, so this is my scalp file, and it's very durable. Knock on wood, I've never separated a scalp file in a canal. So I'm putting a little bit of pressure, then coming out. A little bit of pressure and coming out. And since it's so flexible, it'll follow that canal. Wherever it goes, it'll follow it. Not a lot of pressure, just a little bit of pressure, then come out. A little bit of pressure and come out. And I'll try to go to the apex. So before I place any file in the canal, I use my computer applicator on length. And I'll measure the, the approximate length of the canal on my periapical radiograph. So I know about how far this needs to go to the apex. And sometimes you can see I'm hitting some sclerosis down here. That's the best you can do. But try to go to the apex with the scalp file then irrigating with sodium hypochlorite, then this is my headstrom file. Always curve the file, the hand files, not the drills, but the hand files before you put the file in the canal. Otherwise, it'll bind on the side of the canal. If it's curved, it'll slide into the curvature of the canal. Just irrigating to depth, I mean, filing, just filing to depth, and fill the pulp chamber with sodium hypochlorite. You, Never want to file a dry canal. You want it to be lubricated. Always check the file length between canals. This is a slow speed handpiece with a number six round burr. Just cleaning, just, it's an upward movement. movement. You put this into the, the pulp chamber and then lift up and lift up and lift up. You can see the crack right here in the tooth. Something to remember about endo. This is my football coach in high school used to call this skull drill. When do you perform endodontics on a tooth? Does it have to be abscessed? Does it have to be decayed into the nerve of the tooth? Does it have to be fractured into the nerve of the tooth? From doing complex cases every week, I say no. If you've got a hypersensitive tooth, even if there's not decay into the nerve or anything else into the nerve, remember placing a crown on a tooth does not make it less sensitive. It makes it more sensitive, if, especially if you're preparing the tooth onto the root of the tooth, onto the cementum, if you have gum recession. So if you have a hypersensitive tooth, before I place a crown on that tooth, I may try a desensitizer or something else, but nine out of 10 of those are gonna receive endodontic treatment if it's a significant case, because I don't wanna have to go back through the crown and do endo. So take that out of your mind. It doesn't have to have a pulp exposure to receive endo. Think about the whole case. On these dentistrymasterclasses.com videos, we're talking about a comprehensive approach. And if you want a patient to be unhappy, get to the end of a significant case and they're still having discomfort. and say, I can't eat on that tooth, it's hypersensitive. So from 40, doing this for 40 years, I'm saying if a tooth is hypersensitive to hot, cold, preoperatively, consider endo during the treatment. They'll, remember, if you tell a patient about it ahead of time, it's a reason. If you're tell them, telling them about it after a problem arises, it's an excuse. They'll totally, forgive you and not hold it against you if it's just part of the procedure. But if you have to come back and do things after it's over, especially if it's a significant case, patients don't like that. And you don't like that either as a dentist. So do it going in, okay? Point five, when you're using the apex locator, you want the measurement on the apex locator to be 0 0.5 ideally. That means you're half a millimeter from the apex, that's perfect. I'm using the headstrom file, curving the file, and sliding it into that very lubricated canal. I pull 
the sodium hypochlorite solution in the pulp chamber so that there's lots of lubrication when you're in that canal. And don't force the hand file into the canal. Bend it. And when you're placing it, kind of turn it like this so it follows the canal. You don't want, to, you don't want it to dig into the side and bind because it's hard to get through that if it happens. So again, this is perfect, 0 0.5. Then irrigate, continuing to irrigate with sodium hypochlorite, my third canal, 0 0.4, perfect. Now, what if you're not getting a good reading on the apex locator? There may be too much lubricant in the canal, so I'll take an air syringe and just dry it out a little bit. Get the bulk of the lubricant out of there, and then you'll normally get a good reading. But if there's too much lubrication, too much fluid in the canal, many times the, the apex locator will just kind of go all over the place and not give you a good read. So just dry out the sodium hypochlorite. Uh, irrigation, and this is the EJO2. And when you're using the EJO2, we're gonna do the entire file, the entire canal with this one drill, except for the hand files that you used initially. Now remember, the reason you use the hand files initially you want to get to the apex, that's number one. But number two, you want to clean most of the nerve, 99% of the nerve material out of the canal. Then if you were to separate a drill, it's not that big a deal. If you've cleaned and irrigated 99% of the nerve material out of the canals with the hand files. Now, I said knock on wood, I've never separated an EJO2. It's very durable. I've never separated a scalp file. The other real world endo Brazilier files are more, drills are more rigid. When you use four or five for each canal, you had small, medium, and large. And those you will separate periodically. I've never had that happen with one of these, but if I continue doing endodontics, probably I will one day. So I know if I've cleaned and irrigated those canals thoroughly and I were to separate a file in the canal, it's not that huge of a deal. It's kind of like the old silver points. And I've got lots of patients in my practice that had silver point root canals 40 years ago. And there's, most of them are still holding up fine. So if in that case, if you were to separate a file and you had cleaned the canal thoroughly and irrigated it prior to using the drill, I'm not going to try to retrieve that file. I don't ever remember a patient having a problem if it was cleaned and irrigated thoroughly with the hand files prior to the drill. So the way you use this, you put it in the canal till it just starts to have a little pressure, then you pull it up. Then you put it back in, it goes in a little further, then pull it up. Don't force it until the stopper gets to the tooth. And I irrigate between each canal and I'm just putting a little bit of pressure, then pulling it up. And that, because it's such a weird looking, all this uh, wobbly stuff, it really goes around in that canal and cleans it out thoroughly. But the, never put this into a dry canal. Be sure you fill the pulp chamber with, sodium, with dilute sodium hypochlorite. Now I'm into the next canal. Just some pressure, then pull it up pressure, then pull it up and it'll go a little bit deeper each time. So remember these can canals are sclerotic in the apical one-fourth. Now I'm irrigating with the local anesthesia with the 30 gauge syringe and people, some people have asked in the comments, why are you using local anesthesia? It could be water. Doesn't matter what it is. The only reason we're using this local anesthesia with the 30 gauge syringe is because it has a 30 gauge syringe and that fits the canal perfectly. I'm not putting the syringe or the needle into the canal under pressure. I'm just putting it in the orifice and filling the canal up and floating everything to the surface. So the reason we're using the 30 gauge canal, I mean 30 gauge syringe, is you don't have to buy some special syringe to irrigate the canals. This works perfectly. And in a, with a sodium hypochlorite, I just have it in a regular old syringe syringe and it's a, a, a 10 cc syringe and just irrigate it into the pulp chamber and let it flow into the canals and then the drill, the drills and the hand files take the dilute sodium hypochlorite 
into the canals. You're not trying to put either the sodium hypochlorite or the local anesthetic irrigation into the canals under pressure. Okay, now I'm just opening that up a little bit with my more with my slow speed round burr. This is about a this is a four or six round burr slow speed, and you put it on on the in the pulp chamber and then lift up, lift up like this. Then I'm going to irrigate it again, then irrigating with a local anesthesia just to get rid of the sodium hypochlorite in the canals. Then I'm going to check them one more time, be sure everything is to depth. And this, the stopper on the drill is set to the length we determined with the hand files and the apex locator. So if it was 16 on the apex locator, that's where the stopper on the drill is set. See, this stopper on the drill will be set to 16 or 18, whatever the measurement was with the apex locator. Okay, so 22, and those are rinsing with the local anesthetic again, the 30 gauge needle. And I'm gonna place my, got a perch of cones, take a radiograph. So you've got some sclerosis here, a little sclerosis there. This was an older gentleman. This looks good, it's about right here. But that's, that's as far as you could go. Irrigating again, and just very gently blowing the irrigation. See, I've got, see, I've got direct access to the canals. You don't want to have to go like this to get into the canal. You want to go straight in. Paper points. Now, the thing about this drill, it files to a size 30. So, nine out of ten times, the gutter percha cone is going to be a 30 if you use this EJ02 drill. Sometimes it'll be a 25 if it's a mesial canal on a lower, lower molar or a mesial buckle or distal buckle canal on a maxillary molar. But most of the time it's going to be a 30, so it's just one less thing you have to think about. When you get to the end with the drill, you're going to use a 30 gutta percha cone 9 out of 10 times, which is what these were. Now what if you can't, you have a hyperemic or inflamed canal and it won't stop bleeding? Put a gutta percha cone in there and just leave it under pressure for a minute or so, and then when you take immediately when you take it out, fill that canal. Fill that canal. Sometimes you just can't get rid of all the bleeding, and you just leave the gutter. So you leave the gutta percha cone in until you're ready to fill it. Take it out, squirt the sealer into the canal, and fill it, and you you won't have any trouble. It'll work just fine. So I'll use two. Normally I use two paper points for each canal. Now I'm using, this is not what it is, Josh. It's BC sealer. So we'll use, this is the, this is the uh, stuff is, if you have a perforation, but we're using the BC sealer and you'll squirt, you'll, so you'll squirt the BC sealer into the canal under a little bit of pressure and then place the cone, okay? Then that's the heating instrument. Then come back with a plugger and just plug that seared part and go to the next canal. And this is the BC sealer again. Use the heating element. This one had just a little tiny semblance of a MB2 canal. And so what I've done is clean that out and then I'm just squirting the sealer under pressure into that MB2. And that'll work just fine if it's just a tiny little MB2. And here's the plugger after the heating element. And normally I do them one at a time. Then here's the third canal under a little bit of pressure, the heating element, seared it off, plugger. I'm gonna fill this with IRM. And this is just a very easy way to place a buildup. You wanna let it, then it, once it's set up, you're not gonna have any trouble with eugenol in the IRM affecting either composite or crown and bridge cement. We're gonna place a crown on this tooth. Later, I'm not gonna show that in this video. This was just an endo video. I've used IRM for 40 years and never had any trouble with the eugenol affecting either composite or the cement in the crown. Now you want to be sure before you place composite over it or a crown with cement that the IRM has set completely. When would you place composite? Then an anterior tooth, if you were performing into, endo on an anterior tooth, you'd rather not place a crown on an anterior tooth unless it was badly broken down and you were placing a crown with a post. So normally you're just going to perform the endo and place a little IRM over the, uh, gutta, the coronal part of the gutta percha and then composite. But be sure the IRM is completely set up. This little egg instrument is wonderful for placing IRM or composite. 
Here's the final seal you can see. We're filled to about right here, and this one's about right here, and this one's about right here. Those were all sclerotic, and that's as far as I could go. That's it. So what do you do in those cases? You go as far as you can go and seal it. Now, what if the patient had trouble? Say they developed a lesion on one of these roots, then that's why you want to be able to perform an apicoectomy. You could go back if you had to and remove the sclerotic part of that root with an apicoectomy, retrofill it, no problem. But that's not going to happen very often. I could count on one hand in 40 years, probably less than one hand, the number of cases that I've performed the endodontics on a sclerotic canal and the patient had problems later when you couldn't get to the apex of that root. You think of all the root canals you've seen in your office that probably weren't even done that well, but they're not filled to the apex, and most of the time, those teeth do well. All the silver point root canals you see in your office, they've been there for 30, 40 years. So you want to do good endo. You want to fill to the apex if you can, but if you can't, fill as far as you can and know that, you know, tell the patient and then if you ever did have a problem, you could do an apicoectomy, but chances are 99% you're not going to have a problem. That's the dental minute. These techniques work, and they work every time. If you want the really good stuff and you like these dental minute videos, click on the blue link in the description below and subscribe to DentistryMasterClasses.com. DentistryMasterClasses.com only costs you 20 bucks a month, and you've got all the Dental Minute videos, plus all the comprehensive cases that are complete cases, not in Dental Minute videos. Plus, you've got a library of pertinent articles, such as how to deal with patients taking bisphosphonate, what's the test you can give them to determine if it's okay to extract a tooth or place an implant. What about implant penetration of sinuses? Is that an issue? If it's not an issue, when is it not an issue? How far can an implant penetrate the sinus without calling a, causing a problems? All kind of things. Dentistrymasterclasses.com is like an advanced dental school for each of you. So subscribe to dentistrymasterclasses.com and take your practice to the next level.